Hello again. Welcome to this session. I'm here again uh, on the same stage as yesterday at the same time. Now with another topic, efficient spring data rest development. Ivan reintroduced me. I would like also to say, uh, yes, I'm from Romania. I'm uh, currently living in Bucharest for many years, but no, I was not born there. Uh, I'm uh, currently active for many years in Lux, uh, inside the Luxoft company, where I uh, conduct courses. Mostly I uh, develop courses. I'm a Java and web technologies expert and also the Java chapter lead for Romania. You may find me on uh, Twitter and uh, on LinkedIn if you want to get in contact with me. To remind something that was said also yesterday, I'm also the author of six courses and one project at Pluralsight. The topics were on Java testing, Spring, Java persistence, so related to the talk from yesterday and also related to the talk from today. As an author, at Manning, uh, I uh, already published this JMIT in Action third edition book, and uh, this Java Persistent book is to be published this year. Uh, so this is something that I told you yesterday. What changed since yesterday? I would like to tell that I had the pleasure to meet here again the author of the second edition JMIT in Action with a local guy, Peter Takciev. Don't know if is here. So I added something to my biography to mention today. Now to jump uh, to our topic today about REST to remind you a few things. What is REST? We talk in general about a software architectural style that is for creating RESTful web services. So we are concerned about allowing some interoperability, interoperability uh, between the internet and some computer systems. And in order to do this, we use some set of well-known stateless operations. They are enumerated here, get, pot, get, post, put, patch, delete. And uh, I want to manipulate some web resources that are represented as text. In general, when we talk about REST architecture, we don't talk about something that is protocol specific, but in general, we, we have REST over HTTP. The representation of the state of our resources can be in various formats, usually JSON, but also XML, HTML, and whenever I would like to access a server, I have to specify two things. The identifier or URL of the resource and the operation. I mentioned those verbs. Get, pot, post, put, patch, delete. As yesterday and in general in my talks, we have uh, large demonstrations. And here we have some uh, application that uh, we are going to use as the vehicle uh, driver for uh, our talk. It is concerned with uh, managing some entities in a restful way. I will start uh, the application. And what we have to know, yes, we have uh, this uh, user entity. And we would like to manage the users that are visiting an auction. They are inside a, a database. In order to access the database, we define this uh, interface user repository that extends JPA repository of user and long. This means that as long as I extend this JPA repository, I inherit a set of methods. Yes, I can already use this uh, save, find, whatever uh, CRUD operations that uh, 
we usually need when we interact with the database. And by simply extending this JPA repository, Spring Data will provide us the implementation for these uh, methods, because we say here we are managing entities of type user, and they have IDs of type long, which is happening exactly here. Entity of type user, ID of type long. And we're saying we would like to manage uh, these uh, users from the database from outside through a RESTful application. And in order to do this, created some uh, controller that will represent uh, the front-end part. You see here that I auto-wired this repository. I annotated my class with REST controller. And overall here, I am delegating to the repository. I will have a look at uh, uh, how the application works. You see, it is configured to start on uh, port 8081. By default, it is starting on port 8080, but sometimes 8080 is used by some other processes, so I configure it uh, to start on port 8081. Application.properties is a part of the configuration of a Spring Boot application, and here we are inserting our uh, configuration. And I have started the application. I will access here local host 8081 slash users. And I am getting this response. This is simple, but remember the title of our talk is Efficient Spring Data REST Development. So from now on, we are going to focus on how to make our things and our application more efficient. I'm going to go back here, and here in this uh, commands uh, REST, you see that uh, I prepared a few REST commands that I can send to, to the server from uh, this uh, client. So if I am going to execute this get for user1, I am going to take this information, and if I am going to execute it again, this is sent to the server, and I'm going to get the same information, which is, uh, in general, not so effective, and we are spending pretty much time to get, once again, some information that we already have. What can we do in this case? How can we make our application more efficient? We can use what uh, we call here e-tags, or entity tags. This is the acronym for entity tags. So whenever I am accessing uh, the server, I may receive in uh, the HTTP response header some information that will tell us if there was a change when I am accessing a resource. I may use this in order to avoid too much traffic across the, uh, across the network. I want to be more efficient. I want to efficiently control the data to be retrieved. And eventually, I may reuse something that I already have on my side and that I have cached. And if we go back here, we were talking about e-tags. If we have a closer look at this uh, response, we see here that we had already received this e-tag as a calculated field. I just didn't point out to it, but now it's time to talk about it. That is calculated based on the information, and that can help me decide if I already have the latest version of the information that I want to retrieve, or if I really need to retrieve it again. So, in order to do this, I had to add to my application here two bins in the sense of uh, spring bins to register, to register them. 
Yes? And as I'm having this e tag, I may say, OK, I know that this is the version. And I can generate, instead of saying, get me user with ID1, I may say, get me the user number one, but unless it matches this e tag. So I can copy and paste it here. I think it's the same. Yes. So I'm saying I'm already having uh, the entity that is having this e tag. So don't give it back to me if it is the same. And you see here, response body is empty. 304 means not modified. So don't worry about it. You already have the latest version. I don't need to provide you any more information across the network. You already have the latest information. And this is a first step to make our applications, Spring Data REST applications, more efficient. OK. But let's stop it and have a closer look at a few things here mainly at the level of the controller. You see, this is the front-end part. And I was saying, I will auto-wire here the repository. I will annotate it with uh, REST controller. And in general, my application is, my controller is delegating to the repository. Here you see, most of the things are delegating. And I will make a little change here. I will remove this to be sure that nothing happens. I'm also going to remove the body of the controller. Yes. Let's see what's happening. I am restarting the application. And this was the URL that we're accessing. I'm going to keep this view as a witness. And I'm going to access here again the same URL. Hmm. We are receiving some information here. But you see, it is a little different structure. So I kept this as witness. And you see here, we have name, register, citizenship. While here, besides this information, we are receiving, as additional, some possibilities to navigate inside our users, inside the data that I'm querying. And more here. So I'm told uh, you have some uh, pages here. So uh, I will tell you that if I will access something here. So give me page number one. Divide your information in pages of size five and give me page number two. It is still providing me good things here. And you have here indications about how to navigate inside the set. What is happening? Because as you remember, I removed this uh, user controller. And suddenly, not only that the application does not stop to work, but we are receiving some additional functionality in order to be able to navigate more efficiently inside uh, the set of uh, users. What is happening here is that Spring Data REST takes control. And in general, you will not need such a controller. What is happening is that Spring Data REST will expose this repository by default. It will say, OK, you are building such a Spring Data REST application. You told me this because you already have here this dependency. It was just this dependency that was added to our uh, POM 
in order this effect to happen. So if you are going to build a Spring Data REST application, I know that I have to expose the functionalities of this repository directly, and I will allow you to efficiently navigate inside the set of the users. So you don't have to take care, in general, of writing a user controller and writing a lot of boilerplate code and spending your time just to delegate to the repository. What is happening? You see, here we were explicitly defining these endpoints users. And here these endpoints users still exist. Why? Because by default, Spring Data REST will say, uh, what are you managing? You are managing entities of type user. So I will know how to make the plural of user, its users, and I will expose this repository on endpoint users. You may eventually customize your endpoint. You know, instead of uh, uh, this uh, is the default, so if I will keep it like this, I will just repeat the default, but let's say that I'm having, I will write here in Romanian if you don't mind, it's just something different than users. It's utilizator, which means user. So I will expose this functionality, these endpoints on this new path here. So uh, to demonstrate that this is happening, goodbye slash users, welcome slash utilizatory, or whatever you would like to. It's customizable, and you just have to write a small uh, option inside an annotation. But let's keep it uh, the default way. And now we are going to ask ourselves, what can we do better? What can we do more efficiently? If uh, we have a look here, back to our discussion about e-tags, e-tags were some calculated fields. And this may also take some time. And I have to add two more bins to my, uh, to my uh, spring context. Can we do it more efficiently? Yes, and I'll demonstrate I will remove these bins from our configuration. I will go to this user entity, and I will use some field that is annotated. Uh, it is an annotation version that is uh, used by Java Persistence, and it will tell me the version of uh, the entity. This may be used for uh, various uh, reasons. For example, to know uh, that you cannot write on something that was meantime changed by some other thread access. But it can also be used here for making our uh, application more efficiently and to serve as e-tag. You remember that we are using that hash generated as e-tag. And why not have a closer look at this version annotated field, say, uh, why cannot it serve as an e-tag? So if I have version 2 of this entity, I don't care about it any longer. Don't give it to me. Let me restart here the application. Okay, I will go to these commands. So, I sent a REST command to my repository. See here, we have an e-tag, but we don't have a calculated hash, but it's version zero. You ask for user one, I give it to you, and I'm also going to inform that it is version zero. This one. So, no. 
if it serves as an E tag, let's put it here and verify that now, if I say if none match zero, I get response body empty and response code 304 not modified. Great. Let's demonstrate that it is really like this. So I have user one and I'm going to patch it. So I'm going to demonstrate that the information changed there. Yes. 204 means success it's with two in whatever it's with two HTTP code. Let's have a look here. Uh, you see the e tag changed is now version one so let's presume that on my side i still have version zero uh oh i will give it the whole information to you because you don't have it yet you have version zero while inside the repository the version changed to one and i will give you the whole information and i will say now the e tag is one So now that you have one, I say give it unless it's one. Again, 304 not modified. So we demonstrated that this version annotated field really works as a good e tag. So you can make your calls to your REST application much more efficient, effective. Good. If we ask ourselves, is it worth uh, to use uh, such a version annotated field? I would say yes, most likely yes, because it is much more natural to have a look at uh, uh, a number of this kind, which in most cases will be a short number, not a calculated hash. The calculus of the hash takes some time. And OK, we have to add this version annotated field. We have to add a column. Uh, inside our database, but this is a pretty good trade-off. OK. We'll go back now to the repository. And remember that we exposed here the whole repository. We vanished. This user controller has vanished. And now we may say, OK, what are you exposing me? I'm exposing, in fact, the whole functionality of the repository. Is this what you really want? In most cases, it is not what you fully want. Because if we look again, this JPA repository comes with a lot of functionalities. Let's have a look here. S delete, delete in batch, delete whatever. This may be <laughs> dangerous from outside. I want my the clients of my application to be able to query the data, but in general, not to delete what it is there. Isn't it too much? Yes, it is. And we have uh, some means that Spring Data REST will provide to us in order to make our application more efficient and to quickly block things that we would like not to expose. So, if we go back here, these are the methods that I was saying I would like to block. Let's see if uh, I can delete something now. So my user number one that I have previously got and uh, patched now is deleted. Not a good thing in most cases. But I can quickly stop the access to these uh, functions from the repository. Because I was saying I can get these methods. I am inheriting them from the Spring Data uh, repository, JP repository. And I'm pretending here that I'm overriding somehow, and I say, REST resource exported equals false. So from the outside world, you will not be able to access these functionalities.
So application started. I said, don't export this delete. So let me try, however, to execute this delete. Up 405. Whatever comes with four in front of uh, HTTP response means client error. You try to execute something that is wrong. So I was able immediately, efficiently to change the behavior of uh, my repository and to block access to some methods, simply, quickly. Okay. What else uh, may we like to change or to block? Something that we would like to stop is the access to all these fields. And I was inserting here, name is register, is citizen, whatever. We may have some fields, and you see here in, uh, in our browser that they were all exposed here. And I may come and say, don't give me everything, because something is not appropriate, something is tricky, something is, of, um, is not of interest for the user. So I can quickly do this, and I can do it in some meta information uh, manner. So I can uh, go here. For example, this is registered. I will go on the getter, and I will use an annotation saying here, JSON ignore. This means don't expose it through the repository. Just like this, just one more annotation. And I will restart the application. I go back here to the repository. I will keep this as a witness, I was saying. No. OK, and you see the registration information disappeared. Everything else is here, while this one has been immediately removed, just through an annotation. So you may build some very convenient application quickly, customize it however you would like, and we are still going to talk about uh, customization, through, mostly through annotations, through the usage of the uh, capabilities of the Spring Data repositories. Now, one question that we would like to approach now as we are preparing to, to move to the next demonstration. Based on what we have seen, should we always consider uh, using Spring Data REST or are there situations when you would like to try some uh, other alternatives? And I would say that if we go back to our idea that we were able to remove the controller because it was mostly delegating, it was practically entirely delegating here to the uh, user repository, introducing this uh, direct access to the user repository was, in fact, some shortcut to it. Yes? So, I don't need some uh, intermediate uh, layer like the controller to expose my functionality. But if I will find myself in the situation when I have a lot of business logic here in the controller, probably I should consider writing the controller and forgetting at least for the moment for all these capabilities of Spring Data REST. This is some situation because we have good technologies we have brilliant technologies, but they also have their best use cases and not so good use cases. Okay. I'm going to go back to the presentation. I still have some slides even 
most of uh, the presentation is code-based. We talk about uh, generating some events. Our application has to answer to some events. And uh, we'll have some uh, demo, of course, but uh, what uh, we have to tell from the very beginning about this topic is that we have two ways of generating REST events. How to handle We may write an annotated handler, and we'll immediately demonstrate. Yeah, and we may write an application listener. And, of course, nothing without a code, nothing without an appropriate code demonstration. We have uh, some uh, similar application, just like before. Just we enriched it, so it's the same user that we would like to uh, manage through the user repository. And we're saying, I can write some handler, or I can write an application listener. If we have a look here, okay, what's this? What, what do I have to do, and what's, what's the philosophy between, uh, writing, uh, uh, behind, behind the writing a handler? I will ha annotate with service. It's a bin, and it's a repository event handler. And I will register these methods to handle some events, before create, after create, before delete. So I just chose a few uh, from them. And this is one way to do it. Another way to do it is I am writing my own listener that is extending this abstract repository event listener. And if we are going to get inside it, we'll see that this abstract repository event listener is already providing some uh, methods here, you see on before create, on after create, and so on, which are empty and protected. So it means if you would like to use them in uh, extend me, which are we are really doing here, we are extending this class, and override those methods and make them public to be accessible. And <coughs> we chose from these methods and Overridden, we overrode them. Let's start this application. This another version of our application. So, if I would like to to check here that everything is in place, yes, they are. All information is exposed here. Good. And. I would like to generate an event so that our, our listeners may react, listener and handler may react. So uh, let's delete. OK. And I'm having here some messages. One before delete by handler, before delete by listener, after delete by handler, after delete by listener whatever they would like to say. Now, you may ask yourselves, mm, what should I prefer? OK, I may handle events this way. What should I prefer? Should I prefer an annotation handler or such an event listener? Uh, I will say that, first of all, they are providing absolutely the same uh, functionalities. So whatever method I may override from here, it is mirrored <coughs> here through a method that I can annotate with a corresponding annotation. So all other things being equal, my personal uh, preference will go to the event handlers, because here you still have to extend some class, so you have to hang yourself in uh, some uh, hierarchy, while working at the meta uh, uh, information level seems to me more appropriate through annotations. OK. And we still have a few things to tell about projections and excerpts. 
whatever we uh, notice so far is the default view that Spring Data REST is presenting to us. So it was providing that information with the name, register citizenship, and those links to access. And there are situations when you would like to alter the view of that model for various reasons. Some uh, uh, people are interested by some information or by some information in some particular format. And here, projections and excerpts are coming to the game to make our application more efficient and nice. So I'm going to go back here. We have the same uh, user address. And for our demonstration, we uh, added this uh, another entity address. The repository is the same, plus we have this projection that we are going to talk about and we are going to demonstrate how it helps us doing our things. Just uh, to start uh, our, our application. So, if I am going to access here user number one, for example, this is uh, my default view. Name, address with its fields, and the old registered and citizenship fields. Let's keep this as a witness and take it from here. And I will say projection summary. Why? Because if I go back here, I took this interface user projection, I annotated it with projection name summary. So this will be the name of your projection. What are you going to manage? I are going to manage types user. And what are you exposing? I'm exposing only the name and I'm exposing the address, but not as it was previously exposed, field by field. But to arrive to this format, I annotated it with this value. And what you see here is called, in fact, expression, string expression language. So let's take this two string method from the address class and expose this address through the result of this two string method. So if we look here, you see, okay, we are providing street, zip code, city, state, separated by commas, which is exactly how we format it here. So this is a way to expose our information in a different way. Okay, uh, what else are we able to do? If we go back here to, to this uh, user repository, at some time a little earlier, we were talking that this repository REST resource with path, path users was the default. Remember that here, it was able to function without this because it was saying, I am managing uh, entities of type user, so I make the plural and I will expose it here. Now, we took this excerpt projection user projection class. What does it mean? It means that from now, if you are going to expose the whole, uh, the whole collection, which may happen if I go here to the whole collection of users, yes, then you are going to expose it by default through this user projection. So if I'm going to see here the whole collection, I'm going to see it nicely. So I'm not exposing uh, the citizenship and the registration information. I'm exposing only the name and the address, but in this format. 
Let's demonstrate that it is really this way. So, I'm going to remove this option for here. Of course, I will restart the application. Yes, so this is a witness. And you see the difference between this one and this one. And if we look here, this is like this. This is including the projection ex explicitly. Here, I wanted to include the projection implicitly for the whole collection. So uh, I'm going to go back here. Restart the application and enjoy the one more compact and nice view of the whole collection. This way. And remember you were provided by all these links that you can easily navigate with self-reference. You have here some indications about the size, about pages. You can. This comes as a gift. The pagination, uh, the easy access between uh, the, the records comes as a gift from the Spring Data Rest. So, we are approaching the end of our demonstration before saying you thank you. Just like uh, yesterday, I remind you that uh, if you are interested about any book from Manning, including my two books that I presented, but any other uh, book from Manning, you may get a 35% reduction uh, using this QR code and that reduction code for the period of the conference plus two weeks until the end. You may uh, easily find me on uh, Twitter and eventually on LinkedIn. And uh, not to forget one thing is that uh, the code for uh, the presentation from today and the presentation from yesterday, and also some book here, are to be found in my GitHub repository. So easily to, found, to find and uh, to access. You will find there in, uh, in the books also some topics that are enlarging the topics of uh, our demonstrations from yesterday and from today. So, Still looking forward for some questions. Of course, you may reach me immediately after the talk. And for the rest of the day, I will be here for the rest of the conference. Thank you.